Welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. This is Jay. In this episode, we welcome Chris Gilbert back to the podcast to discuss his new book, Commune or Nothing, Venezuela's Communal Movement and its Socialist Project. Chris Gilbert is a professor of political studies at the Universidad Bolivariana de Venezuela and creator and co-host of Escuela de Cuadros, a Marxist educational television program and podcast. Gilbert is also the co-author of Venezuela, The Present as Struggle, which we hosted two episodes on along with its co-author, Sira Pascual Marquina. We also hosted a conversation in 2022 with Chris Gilbert that related to an essay that is a chapter of this book, which discusses the theoretical work behind seeing communes as building blocks of a socialist metabolism. If you missed any of those conversations, I highly recommend them. And they will also help fill in some informational gaps of things we just don't touch on deeply in this conversation. We recorded this episode back in September, prior to October 7th, which would have definitely warranted some attention in the conversation, particularly as Gilbert talked about sanctions as total war and viewing Venezuela as a concentration camp, remarks that resonate with the Palestinian experience currently. This was also recorded prior to some of the recent developments in Venezuela, including among many other things, the Esquibo referendum, Biden threatening harsher sanctions against Venezuela, and the arrest of 32 people in alleged assassination plots. The best place, as always, to stay abreast of developments in Venezuela is to follow and support the work of Venezuela Analysis. We'll link that in the show notes as well. We talk about many things in the conversation, but a few I will highlight are Gilbert's theoretical work, building on the work of feminist social reproduction theory, and Marxist theory of value to put forth the concept of directly social labor as a key to the emancipatory, anti-racist, anti-patriarchal possibilities of the commune. Gilbert also shares some of the contributions of African Maroon communities and indigenous communal practices to the development of Venezuela's socialist vision. We talk about why for Gilbert the commune represents a recovery of Marx, in particular the romantic Marx who saw a revolutionary potential among the Iroquois Confederacy, Algerian peasants, and Russian peasant communes. Along the way, we talk about a commune that is geographically the size of Manhattan and discuss currency experiments, communal banking efforts, and the process of de-alienation that Gilbert sees in the commune. The book is out now from Monthly Review Press. I highly recommend it. It was one of our favorite books that we read in 2023. We'll include a link to that in the show notes. And if you like what we do, please support us at patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism. We have a study group that starts for patrons tomorrow night, February 8th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, studying the counterinsurgency field manual. So this is a final call for anyone interested in joining us for that as well. Now, here is our conversation with Chris Gilbert on Commune or Nothing. Chris Gilbert, welcome back to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. Uh, It's great to have you back on the show. This is becoming a little bit of a, like, almost an annual occasion for us and one that we definitely enjoy. Last year, we had you on to discuss your piece, Metzaros and Chavez, the philosopher and the Llanero, you know, which was released first as an essay on monthly review. And it's a kind of a very important chapter in this book. But I'm also glad that we had that conversation as well as the others that we had with you and Sira on your previous book, Venezuela, The President Has Struggle. Because we're going to ask a lot and we'll go into a lot of depth, but there's also a lot of context that, you know, we probably won't go as much detail on, obviously, that chapter and on some of the other work that you've done on communes, which folks can listen to those discussions in general to get more if they haven't or revisit them if they've listened before. And that specific essay on Mesaros and Chavez, it really deals with kind of the theory at play. And I'm sure that we'll we'll touch on some aspects of that today because it's kind of necessary to understand this book. So if folks want to understand more on kind of Chavez, Massaro's Marx, and your work around the theory of the commune as a basis for socialist metabolism, that particular conversation, which we'll link, it, folks should definitely check out. But before we get started and get into like more specific questions, just wanted to give you space if there's any general comments you wanted to make about this book project kind of up front. 
Thanks, Jay. I'm, I'm very happy to be here again. About the book in general, one thing that I like to emphasize from the start is why she, people should read it. I, I'd like to be very direct about that. Marx, in an introduction to Capital, says, anticipating a question from German readers, why they should be interested in a book about England or English capitalism. He says, De te fabula narratura. In Latin, this is a story about you. So I think this is a story about you, about everybody about a possible socialist model, about a model for socialist construction that we're seeing taking place in Venezuela, but it also is applicable worldwide with changes, of course. I would say, you know, changing the changeable and adapting to local context. But it's, I say it's a model, but it's also a hypothesis, which means it's a model that's in, potentially in debate or that's thrown forward with a view to debate. I think that in that sense, you have to always combat Eurocentrism because there's a tendency to not pay sufficient attention to the developments that take place in the global south, historically, the case that always comes to mind is Maoism. You know, people, I find that in the global north, people are always much more interested in the Soviet example of socialism. They do not pay enough attention to the different Maoist experiments. So we say the same thing here. Here's a model that we're looking at taking place in Venezuela, but it's not a story only about Venezuelans. It's a story about everybody. It's a story about people listening to this podcast. The other thing that I'd like to say is that it's a book that is not it has a sort of journalistic or chronicle character to it. About half the chapters are chronicles, stories about visits to communes. But I'd like to highlight the fact that I've been engaged with the Bolivarian process for almost 18 years. So it's not as if I come to Venezuela as a visitor or even less so as a tourist. I think that's important. It's a, it's a book that represents, in some sense, two or three years of immediate research, but it also represents a longer standing engagement with the Bolivarian process, with the Bolivarian revolution. And in that sense, I'd like to point to some stylistic thing, I, which I think actually makes the book more accessible in the best sense. And that is that, you know, there's a saying that you should write a book that, that is like 70% candy and 30% theory. And that's actually a sad way of putting it. But when I was writing the book, I was thinking about models that combine engagement, concrete stories, anecdotes, with theoretical reflections, with the idea that the theoretical reflections emerge from the empirical engagement. In that sense, it's perhaps not the most common form of writing right now, but of course, there are great examples in history, probably for most people that John reads, 10 Days That Shook the World comes to mind. But for example, William Hinton's work on the on Chinese villages during the revolution, or I think even of Engels' work, Situation of the Working Class in England, or even the great example written by Marx himself, which is the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, where there's a sense in which you talk about history, you talk about things developing, but at the same time, you're drawing conclusions from what you actually experience. And then when I say it makes it more accessible, I, I say that the best arguments in the book are the experiences. The best arguments in the book are the concrete facts that readers will encounter. And I so invite people to accompany me in those discoveries as I relate them, as I relate the visits to the communes. So there's an invitation to the reader to join me in a process of discovery. That's my own process of discovery. In that sense, people often debate in what sense Marxism is a science, especially given that Marx himself was writing before a lot of the parameters of today's science were developed. But I think the best and clearest sense in which you can say Marxism is a science is that the arguments are repeatable. And since the arguments in this book are experiences, I want people to repeat those experiences with me, hand in hand with me, and be able to henceforth accompany me and draw their own conclusions from those experiences which are related in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So yeah, so I, I think we talked about this a bit last time, but I'm interested in you laying out a bit of how Venezuela got to the point where Chavez established the law of communes. In other words, could you talk about the social and political forces and contradictions that led to the development and vision of socialist development? Uh, Josh, that's a great question. Going back to Marx, Marx says that um, communism is not an idea, but a real historical movement. And I always try to keep that in mind in Venezuela, that the process of building communes, and on the one hand, the whole Bolivarian revolution, in a more proximate sense, the building of communes, all that grows out of a huge, long historical process. So on the long term, we can look at the you know 500 years of resistance to colonialism, the search for independence. In the book, the second chapter he takes up a historical perspective and looks at the indigenous and maroon contributions to the communal project. Venezuela's indigenous societies were highly democratic, highly horizontal societies. 
And of course, there was a large number of enslaved Africans who were brought to the Venezuelan territory, what later became the Venezuelan territory. And there was a practice of enslaved Africans escaping and forming their own maroon communities, which were called cumbes here. Those cumbes were uh, at some points formed networks of up to hundreds of independent communities, self-governing communities across the Venezuelan territory. So in some long Dore sense, these projects of anti-colonial or anti-slavery resistance feed into the communal project today. If we come closer to the present, one looks at the Bolivarian process, there is an important lemma of the Bolivarian process, which is participative and protagonistic democracy. I think that's kind of like the regulative ideal, the guiding light of the process from its beginning, even before it declared itself to be socialist, even before it declared itself to be anti-imperialist. So as I see the Bolivarian process unfolding, there was an, an attempt now over 20 years or even more, if you think of it at the beginning of the 1990s, of experimentation with different models by which this participative protagonistic democracy could be realized. And that eventually leads to anti-imperialism, socialism, and finally the socialist model there's an understanding that has to be developed from communes. I think we talked about this partly in the in the episode about Masauros, so I won't rehearse all the elements of this, but one thing I'd like to say is that in those experiments, there was an experiment of political local government, which is the community council, that emerged around 2005. And then there was also the experiment of, of more like state-run, sometimes worker-run, sometimes co-managed factories. And so in some important sense, the communes are an attempt to bring together to synthesize those two things. As we mentioned before, with Mesaros, Mesaros' idea about a social metabolism in, in the background. But the communes are on the one hand political and they're also economic forms of self-government, or we say political forms of self-government that include the productive element that comes from the self-managed factories, things like that. And that's where around 2009, Chavez declares the commune as the basic self for constructing socialism. As a result of this long reflection that involves a dialogic relationship with popular, the popular movement. And then one year later, that's when the laws are developed. The actual unfolding of the laws is by, you know, in other words, when Tra Travis throws the idea forward in 2009, it's not exactly like a linear development. That's one of the stories of the book. Yeah, right on. And I, you know, I really appreciate in the book, just the framing too, of like the importance of you know, the protagonism from below of the, you know, of popular power and these kind of forces, you know, like Chavez using the the law as a, a move from above to support that movement from below, you know, and uh, and to try to give it more strength and more more power. And I think that's a really important thing for folks thinking about like concepts of like dual power and things like that. Right. I think a lot of times people get too focused on legislative or like executive orders, things like that, right? Like, you know, mayors or city councils implementing policies that in themselves are, you know, socialistic, right? It's sort of, I guess, the classical social democracy approach rather than kind of clearing the way and giving a path for people from below to sort of seize on their own historical momentum and protagonism. And I appreciate that in your in your writing of this and examination of this. So you write in your section on the essence of the commune, quote, what is the essence of the commune in all of this? In fact, what Bertolt Brecht said about a factory, that from the outside, you cannot tell much about the real social relations, capitalist or socialist operating there, applies to what you see in the Venezuelan commune. The essence of a commune is a new set of social relations, which are usually not immediately visible. The most important of these, and a necessary feature in the communal system, as it existed before and might exist in the future, is directly social labor, end quote. So I really want to lay this out a bit because this idea of directly social labor seems really important. Um, it's something you lay out early in the text, I believe, maybe even in the introduction. You're also working with the concept of socially reproductive labor. Folks who are familiar with the work of, you know, Marxist and socialist feminists will be familiar with this concept. You write that there's a seed here that also explains why for you, the communal model also presents a better opportunity to combat structures like racism and patriarchy, which I think is a very interesting point and argument. So explain to us what you mean by directly social labor, 
and why it's so important in the overall theory of communes as building blocks of socialist construction. Sure. Um, this I want to say is probably the most important theoretical contribution of the book. I, like a lot of theoretical contributions, I believe that it's in some sense completely obvious once it's articulated. I hope it's completely obvious once it's articulated that this should be the understanding of communes and about the emancipatory potential that they contain. And one of my main sources, I mean, apart from a, a longstanding commitment to Marxism and the center of Marxism is value theory, but what exactly value theory is is open to debate. But the other main source of inspiration for under, for this theoretical model is social reproductive feminism or social reproductive st- re- reproduction theory. One thing that we, so, oh, when I say the essence of the communist directly social labor, it's important to understand the, the whole of capitalist society and how it functions. I think the great contribution of social reproduction theory is that it helps us to understand what the totality of labor relations that are established in a capitalist society are. And Marxism is generally focused on the wage relation, but that's only half the story. The other half of the story is unpaid, unweight labor, unpaid labor, which is historically, generally, and even today, is still usually carried out by women. So when I say that the essence of the communist directly social labor, the idea is that when you look at half of the labor that's done in capitalist society, that labor is not directly social at all. It is social. Many people naively think that capitalist labor is not social and they talk about the socialization of labor, but capitalist labor in our globalist society is highly social. That means that thousands of people can be involved in making the telephone one holds in one's hands, or at the same time, the telephone will be distributed by thousands of people. So it's highly social, two thousands of different or millions of different recipients. But the way that labor is socialized across in capitalism is not social at all. The way this so-called productive labor or wage labor is socialized in capitalism it is not directly social at all. That means it's mediated by the market. Essentially, the labor is crystallized in a commodity, and the commodity begins its, its flight, its leap of faith or its blind leap into the market and then ends up in other people's hands. So that it's not directly social because it's mediated by the market, it's indirectly social. And this is, leads to alienation, for example, and this is the way when Marxists talk about fetishism, they're talking about how things mediate the relation between people. The productive labor, the so-called productive labor that is indirectly social, that is wage labor, is also the site of exploitation in capitalist society. I'm using exploitation in the technical sense of working longer hours than is required to pay for your reproduction as a laborer. So that's where surplus value comes in. So productive labor, wage labor, indirectly social labor is the site of exploitation in capitalist society. But as feminists in the past almost 50 years have indicated, social reproduction feminists have, have taught that that's only half the story. The other half of labor, or more than half of labor in, in a capitalist society is unpaid labor. This involves in reproducing life, involves in reproducing the labor force in the case of the unpaid labor of the working class. And this is not a site of, technically speaking, exploitation, but rather expropriation. And it's a site of many oppressions, gender oppression, also racial oppression. So the promise of the commune, I say, is to bring what has formerly been indirect labor into a direct democratic context. So you can think of a situation, direct labor is where we as a community decide what we're going to do and we do it. And then we, we consume what we produce. But at the same time, the communal model offers the possibility to bring the unpaid labor into the same democratic, socialized, directly social democratic world of the community. Hence, it comes out of the hidden workshop, what Nancy Fraser calls the hidden workshop of the house, home, the invisible, under, under-recognized, unpaid labor comes out into a social sphere. That way, we end up abolishing the hierarchy of the capitalism establishes between so-called productive labor and reproductive labor. We end up eliminating, potentially eliminating the oppressions that exist in the sphere of unpaid labor. And we end up, we can end the exploitation that, that happens in the sphere of wage labor. So in some sense, like when I present this idea, which I consider to be totally obvious once it's articulated, my, I always often throw the question, you know, I want to turn the question around and say, where not, except for in a commune, can you overcome this hierarchy? that exists in capitalism between reproductive and productive labor, where else can you overcome the whole gamut of oppressions that exist in a capitalist society? Not only the exploitation that exists in the wage relation, but the forms of oppression that are generated when reproductive labor is involved, the oppression of women in the household, the oppression of racialized people who are often forced to assume the task of social reproduction. So I say that 
not only is it that Marx said that the future society would be freely associated labor, but in some logical sense, I believe that the communal or the community production, communally organized, directly social labor that's in a democratic context is the only place where one can address this range of oppressions, including exploitation, including the expropriative relationship we generally have with nature. Now, there's one important caveat that if you think about the communes that exist in the world and have existed across history, many of them are anything but emancipatory. If you look at, for example, you can think of religious communities that establish their communes. In Bolivia, for example, there are large Mennonite communities. And these become sites of a lot of patriarchal oppression. So the important thing is not only directly social labor, but also a democratic context, a solidarity context, and a self-critical context. So that's what allows one to unleash the full emancipatory potential of, of communal situation. Right on. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, for sure. So the last time we had you on, we asked you a question about Mizarro's being unorthodox. And what we meant was not following a particular trajectory of what we might call 20th century socialism. And you pushed back against our question, challenging the notion of orthodoxy. And on the same subject in the introduction you write, I'm quoting here, the story of the 20th century socialism is largely one of how state party vanguardism, misbranded as Leninism, was consolidated through complicated process in which no one individual can be blamed as socialist or orthodox. Yet this orthodoxy is essentially the idea that the state and party can conduct the socialist project, which is in turn conceived as command economy with the masses cast in roles of beneficiaries is outright revisionism. It replicates the subject predicate uh, inversion that Marx opposed and results in no more than another form of extracting surplus labor from above in an economy in which the labor processes are not controlled by the direct producers. Marx, from the beginning, was committed to the conscious self-emancipation of the working class, and he did so not for sentimental reasons, but because anything else was a contradiction in terms of when the issue is people becoming full and active subjects. Uh, Self-emancipation was a paradigm that Marx put forth first at age 25 and led it to Arnold Rogue, or Rouge, I think it is, and he never abandoned it, end quote. So you also write about the Venezuelan project as recovery of Marx's innocence. So yeah, if you would lay out a bit more about the argument you're making here. Thanks, Josh. I, well, I just want to talk about self-emancipation and, the, and coming directly from Marx and how Venezuelan communists recover what I consider to be the original Marxism, Marxism, Marxist original idea, which includes different elements. One is the commune. Marx talked a lot about the commune, especially later in life. But I think references to the commune, as I was saying just now, are embodied or implied. There's an implication when Marx talks about freely associated labor that's in the Communist Manifesto. But if we wind back the clock, I said it was from the very beginning. You know, certainly before Marx considered himself a communist, he thought self-emancipation was the nature of emancipation. And I think that has to do with how Marx conceives the human being as a full agent. The, The aim of communism is to allow for the full potential of a human being to allow for richer social relations. And to Marx frequently used this term all around human development. So the process of emancipation has to be an expression, a prefiguring and an expression of that human development of the full human agency. So when I heard of the letter, and I, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, the German name, Arnold Grouch, who was a young Hegelian uh, that was written in 1843. Marx says, of course, it was Marx as a young Hegelian had a Hegelian language, and he liked to turn phrases on top of their heads. So he talks about thinking humanity and suffering humanity. And then as a, as a Hegelian-minded person, he tries to invert those terms. So he says, thinking humanity, that would refer to his own context, the, you know, we could say the, the middle-class intellectuals of his time. And that, of course, was the focus of the young Hegelian. Young Hegelians believed in a kind of philosophical emancipation. Unfortunately, that kind of idea still exists today. I suppose it will exist as long as capitalism exists, that we can emancipate ourselves through some kind of merely philosophical reflection. And then behind the idea that philosophical reflection would emancipate us was that the class of people who are intellectuals with a capital I, the philosophers, would emancipate us. So that's what Marx uses calls short, with the shorthand thinking humanity. But then at the same time, Marx, what Marx discovers at that point and begins to realize is that it refers to suffering humanity. And suffering humanity, I think he has in mind the workers' movements who were taking shape at that time. One year later, later after the letter was written, there was a revolt of the Salation weavers, which really inspired Marx. And then he refers to thinking humanity that suffers. That would be his own intellectual class. And he refers to suffering humanity who thinks. 
a grand somatic agency who realizes that suffering humanity thinks and the suffering humanity that thinks that will do the revolution. I think that's where Marx conceives of the proletariat is, the suffering humanity that thinks is the real agent of the revolution. And that's where the notion of, of self-emancipation comes in. So it's Marx's critique of his own former tendency, a young Hegelian tendency, when he realizes not the intellectuals, or at least not the intellectuals alone that will do the revolution, but principally it will be the working class, which is also a thinking, projecting, doing agent that will emancipate itself. And this is also present in Marx's critique of utopian socialism, which maybe some elements require revision right now, because when they critique utopian socialism, they think we can do socialism without acts of imagination. But what Marx didn't like was the prescription, saying this revolution is going to be like this. Some person, whether it's saint Simon or Fourier, he's saying the revolution is going to look like this. No, rather Marx thinks the oppressed subject will construct their own future and that self-emancipation. And this is developed later on in Marx. When Marx gets more profound in, in his critique of capitalist economy, he comes to understand how there's the notion of fetishism. You know, fetishism would be how things in part is the story of how things come to replace human beings in capitalism. Right now with artificial intelligence, that's seemingly, seemingly become a very acute, that very acute expression of that. But even in Marx's time, he realized that, you know, that this process that he calls real subsumption by which machinery begins to organize and take over the human subjectivity, even in the labor process. In our time, the whole host of even intellectual capacities seem to be passed over to machines. So that's very much part of Marx's later critique, you know, developed critique of capitalism is how capitalism tends to take away human agency, tends to convert us into predicates and not subjects. So the very process of emancipation is going to be human beings becoming subjects recovering their subjectivity. And that's going to be expressed all along the way, not only in the final product of the revolution. Now, the thing I would like to say, writing from Latin America, is that Latin America is the world of self-emancipation. I don't mean to downplay any other revolutionary processes, but what I know is that in Latin America, there's a huge and long process of what's called popular power, poder popular. It's been central to the revolutionary process in Latin America. And I suppose I throw out as a hypothesis that it has a lot to do with the indigenous legacy in which Indigenous communities put a high value, of course, many, uh, there were many different varieties of indigenous political and social formations, but as a rule, indigenous communities in the Americas put a high value on self-determination. In some sense, self-determination and freedom, even before equality, as David Graeber points out. But that, I think that that, it, that notion of self-determination of the subject being in the first place has been part of the Latin American revolutionary process from the beginning. In Chile, in the early '70s, that was discourse about poder popular. In the '80s, in the in the Central American revolutions, it was it was also key. And that emerged in Venezuela as you know the whole commitment to like grassroots. It's just the grassroots that's going to do the revolution. That you can have leaders, but it's essentially the grassroots, and there's and they construct power on the grassroots level. And that construction of power can happen both before the revolution, before taking power, and it also has to continue to grow after taking power. So in Venezuela, that's when I say that Venezuelans recovered this original Marxist idea, you could say that, you know, as part of a longstanding Latin American tradition to make sure that the vanguard doesn't substitute the people. You know, it's the people who are going to do the revolution and they're going to do it through popular power. I referred to the, I referred earlier to the Chavista slogan, uh, participative and, par and protagonistic democracy. Well, that's a clear expression of popular power. And that's always been the central idea of the of the Venezuelan political process, of the Bolivarian process. Um, so it's through that that Venezuelans, I say, recovered the original thesis of Marxism. And in my book, I talk about different, I rather touch upon different elements of that. In Venezuela, there was an important social revolution that happened more than 200 years ago, in which the white elite was essentially run out of the country and the churches were destroyed. It's the second social revolution that took place in modern times in the Americas after the Haitian Revolution. So the first real social revolution carried out in the Americas was the Haitian Revolution. But there's much less recognized revolution that happened in the Venezuelan territory in which the black and brown people in this country and what became this country turned the tables on the, on the institutions and established a highly democratic society. And then that, this kind of expression of popular power continued through the 19th century through the federal wars and it arrives in our present, in our 21st century called Chavismo, called the Bolivarian process. And it's there that I think the recovery of original Marxism, which 
is not only self-emancipation, but also the commune. The commune is also central in Marx, especially the late Marx, but maybe that's something we want to talk about elsewhere or later on. Right on. So I want to get into a little bit of a discussion of some specific communes here. So you write, at the entrance of El Maizal is a large billboard announcing the commune. It reads commune or nothing and shows Chavez and Nicolas Maduro on horseback with the former out in front and the latter hustling to catch up. Soon we arrive to the main cluster of farm buildings. This is no hippie commune. A heavy machinery shed lies off to one side on the right. A noisy corn flour processing unit rises up not far from it. A big cattle tending complex with spaces for feeding, washing, and veterinary work stretches out to the left. All the buildings bear names from the heroic Latin American revolutionary tradition. I'm not going to try to do all the names because I'll mess them up, but it continues. Tractors are constantly refilling with fertilizer and heading out to the fields, which extend in all directions from the busy rural headquarters, end quote. So I appreciated this section because it also helps people visualize what we're talking about. I do think that even though it should be clear to us that we're not talking about hippie communes, that is very often... <laughs> I think the image that we have in the United States, even though I know even there are communes in the United States that are not necessarily that type either. But, you know, I I know you're examining also in Venezuela several different communes, which are of different size and very different scale. But maybe it would just help for folks to ground them a little bit further in understanding, you know, kind of what you're talking about. If you just spend a few minutes Talking about the scale of some of these communes that you examine, the types of production and projects that they are engaged in. Uh, yeah. One thing I want to say in passing is that I have a lot of respect for hippie communes. I, we should always be suspicious when, when there's a cultural, you know, knee-jerk reaction against something. And the interesting thing is that the hippie movement was uh, impressively not only did they form communes, but it was one of the lasting countercultural, a full countercultural movement that happened in the 60s. Uh, so, but of course, on the questions of scale, that's why I brought it up, and I'm sure that's why you're repeating it. It's like a totally different scale. And a lot of that has to do with the way the Bolivarian process emerged. You know, like the probably the immediate predecessor of the kinds of popular power that exists in Venezuela is the Zapatista movement. But the interesting thing about the Bolivarian process is that it, the Zapatista movement was radically autonomous, and the Bolivarian process took political power first, and then there was a dialogic relationship with the state, a dialectical relation with the state which I always say allowed for a much fuller blooming of popular power, you know, and that's representing the scale of the communes. Because, for example, taking two communes, the two maybe, not two arbitrary communes, but the two most successful, most robust communes in the country, which are very, very different. El Maisal, the one you were reading the passage, is about, El Maisal has about 2,300 hectares of land, which, according to my calculations, that's about the size of Manhattan. It brings together, I guess, 27 community councils, it brings together 3,600 families and about 13,000 people in the commune. So it's a very large scale to things. That's just in terms of demographics. But apart from that, then there's the whole productive angle. They raise cattle, both cattle for meat and cattle for dairy cattle. And they're called El Maisal, the maize grove or the corn grove, because they produce corn um, on a large scale. They also produce vegetables, coffee, and then... Like a lot of communes end up taking over city services, like the distribution of cooking gas, which is very important in Venezuela. Then they also process the corn. So it's a huge operation. Then if we take the other, I was mentioning two big communes, Vante Tresanero, which is a, a famous barrio of Caracas in the, in the west of Caracas, famous for its revolutionary activity. There's El Panal commune. Panal would be the beehive. And it's about the same size. It has about, in this case, 4,000 families, about 13,000 people, the same size in terms of people. They have also quite a diversity of productive projects. They have a textile, well, clothes making workshop. They have a pig project, which recently was formerly in the city using deep bed Cuban methods. But now they've, since I've written the book, they've taken the, the pig project outside of the city. Uh, they also raise fish and they, um, have fish selling shops. Now they've recently moved into recycling like an important urban, there's another important urban commune that I, is even more involved in 
sanitation and recycling that I deal with in the book, which is Luisa Castaneda's commune in uh, Barcelona and Venezuela's Barcelona. And so we're talking about huge operations, a uh, big scale, and that's partly made possible. You know, one might, one might ask the question legitimately, but how is that possible? And again, I go back to the development. You know, this is a process in which popular movement has a high degree of autonomy from the state. It's also always been in a dialectical relation with the state, which means relying on state laws. The laws give a legal format for the communes. And the state can sometimes give support, material support, should give more material support. But essentially, the formula for making communes is bringing together community councils. So the law says that it should be 10 to 20. And there's an, in a rural context, the idea is it should be larger because the community councils in a rural context incorporate fewer people. And El Canal is about nine community councils that come together. And it's more than 20 in the case of El Maizal. So these are huge operations. And one interesting development is, as I mentioned in the book, um, Angel Prado, who was the one of the leaders of the El Maizal commune, did win the mayor's election in his, in his municipality and became the mayor, which is a whole new development, which gives the commune access to resources. But you could say, legitimately, many people wonder what will happen to the commune's autonomy, what will happen to popular power. That might be the subject of another book. Yeah, right on. So this is an important piece, you know, and I wanted to bring it up kind of earlier, earlier in this conversation to make sure that we address it, is, you know, the role of U.S. sanctions. Obviously, in the United States, this is something that we should be taking seriously and organizing against. But also, there's an interesting relationship, I think, here in terms of the communes specifically and some of the contradictions that have been caused by the sanctions. So you write, quote, U.S. sanctions are one of the main obstacles to the commune's progress to say nothing of the well-being of the rest of Venezuelans. Cruel and pointless measures that restrict commerce in everything from fuel to medicine these sanctions have struck hard against both rural and urban life in Venezuela. One of the commune's survival strategies has been to diversify its economy by incorporating the area's small producers into its network. The commune gives them credits and material support. They, in turn, cultivate what Matos calls war crops, native beans, yuca, and sorghum. Small producers later repay the commune with a part of their harvest. Another huge problem is the local bourgeoisie who harass the commune, while regional bureaucrats too often side with them, meaning the local bourgeoisie, end quote. In a later section on El Panal, you write, Longa came up with the idea of declaring 2020 to be year zero for the commune. It meant that what looked like the end could also be seen as a beginning, end quote. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, this is complicated. And, you know, again, like I want to reiterate to folks here in the United States, our our position should be to be, you know, struggling against these sanctions. But can you talk a little bit about how communes have struggled during the pandemic and amid U.S. sanctions to protagonize and reinvigorate communes in this context? Yeah, just like you, I want to pause about the question of my of the correct indignation I should have in the face of the sanctions. For me, I had a very vivid encounter with the reality of what sanctions mean, because for health reasons, I spent 18 months or more in Barcelona, Barcelona in, in Catalonia. And then I came back as the confinement of the pandemic ended. And what I encountered was just a total devastation of the population. You know, often, you know, hunger, people had lost, the average person lost something like 22 pounds. People's clothes were essentially, they clothes gradually was falling off because of their emaciation. And I can say that it filled me with a real hatred, you know, hatred and indignation, which is the correct attitude. The difficult thing is to maintain it, you know, and when people don't see it with their own eyes, you know, many people have died, 40 to 100,000 people have died as a result of the sanctions. And I compare it to a concentration camp because one thing about the sanctions is that unlike the other wars, you know, this is a kind of war by other means in the first place, and it falls the civilian population. Because, of course, Venezuela is a society divided into classes and privileged people in government and will not suffer directly. So that's why I say it's, they're pointless and contradictory because 
presumably the idea of the United States or the politicians of the United States, including Bob Menendez, a certain protagonism in formulating the sanctions, was to to punish the government. But they, the means by going out punish the people in the first place. So that's why I say they're contradictory. I don't think the government should be punished, but even if I thought the government should punish, it shouldn't be punished by way of the people. It's far beyond what in the, in the 20th century, perhaps earlier, people talked about total war, or, you know, attacking the civilian population. But that, but that's taken a step further with sanctions. And that's why I say it's like a concentration camp. It puts old people, children, everybody in the same boat of hunger trapped in the same area. And that's why, you know, Robert Longa, who's this uh, charismatic uh, leader of the, of the El Pano commune, one thing about that kind of situation is people are demoralized. I mean, on top of everything else, there's a high degree of demoralization trying to find a way forward. I say in the, in the book that he became a kind of poet in residence, you know, someone who tried to find ways in which people could turn the tables on their situation, you know, find imaginative ways in which they could think beyond the horrible present and project a future. And I think that's one of his great successes is remoralizing people in the commune, getting them to go forward through different experiments, different thought experiments, different phrases even. That's why I say it's like a poet in residence. So that's the worst of the sanction situation. In the book I refer, I find myself, found myself referring to this phrase of Dickens, the worst of times and the best of times. Dickens wasn't a revolutionary. In fact, he was probably the opposite. He probably thought the revolution, best of times and the worst of the times, was the French Revolution for him. But he probably thought more worse than best. But, you know, it's a good, in some ways, it's a good description of a revolution because a revolution, in this case, emerged out of the ashes of the worst of times. Because, as I was saying, you know, when Chavez threw the communal idea out to people, it didn't immediately seize them. People registered, there were thousands of communes that were registered on paper, but the communal project didn't really get going until this very bad crisis happened in the middle of the last decade. So around 2015, 2016, in the worst of times, people began to turn to the commune. Actually, there's a great book by Rebecca Soldner called Paradise Built in Hell that deals with the same kind of phenomenon, whether it's earthquakes or tsunamis or different disasters, human or human-made or environmental. People often begin to turn to practices of mutual aid. They begin to connect with their neighbors and they begin to build something new, project something new, project a better society. It's a chance when ordinary people, the masses, can project their ideal society forward. And as Rebecca Solna points out in her book, those projects that emerged in the, the paradises built in hell are only lasting if there's a kind of blueprint beforehand, if people have a strategic project. And that's precisely what Chavez supplied people with here, or the Bolivarian process supplied people with here. So in, this, in the worst of times, they were able to turn to the commune and begin to build something using the strategic model that was in part embodied in a set of laws, but it embodied in, in discourses, and they could take hold of it. In the very first line of the book, I referred to Marx saying that an uh, idea becomes a material force when it grips the masses. I said that's true, but Marx should have said that when the masses seize the idea, and they seize the idea because it coincides with their own wishes. And that's kind of what happened in Venezuela, or very exactly what happened in Venezuela with a delayed time you know, with a delayed temporality. So Chavez throws the idea out in 2009. It doesn't really take hold until five or six years later when he's dead. And then it's the worst of times and people take hold of the idea and begin to build and go forward. So that's why I say that the model here is like the sine wave. You know, the communal idea really dipped down in 2013, 2014. There were a whole wave of communes that were built very fragilely and they disappeared. But around 2015, 2016, El Maizal begins to take land El Panal begins to expand. It expands beyond the law because at that time, the whole process of forming community councils was on hold. In the pandemic, the government decided there weren't going to be any elections and community councils. So in El Panal, the one in Caracas and Vente de Janeiro, they formed their own social model called Panelitos, and they began to build their own councils and go forward. So it's a great heroic achievement. You know, I say about how the book developed, and one thing for me was in mid-2021, I made my first protracted visit to my saw commune. And then the reality hit me, essentially. You know, the impressive things people were doing, the way popular power was being built. And as a way of doing homage to it, I wrote my first piece about the commune. I always say if I'd been a painter, I would have made a painting. If I had some other way of expressing 
the greatness, the wonder of what they were doing, I would have turned to that. But as it turns out, I'm a writer. And so I wrote about it. Yeah, right on. And um, this is a little bit of a lengthier, well, it is a lengthier quote I'm going to read here, but I really appreciated the section on a number of levels. I think because, as you said in the beginning, you know, you wrote this book for, for everybody, right? And this was a section where I could really see something that also had theoretical and practical implications, I think, in a context like the United States, even though it's written very specifically about the particularities in Venezuela. So you write, along with the surviving indigenous communities, which already embody many socialist values, the country's social fabric contains practices of communitarian coexistence, varied forms of social solidarity, and above all, many surviving expressions of egalitarian social relations. This living legacy has a relevance that goes beyond the micro level of the isolated kumbe or community for the indigenous and Afro-Venezuelan inheritance includes the possibility of reactivating an alternative geometry of power based on pre-colonial and maroon networks that once existed throughout the territory, which could be revived and adapted in the process of building socialism. Both the civilization of the Cacatillo, who had a network reaching out into the Caribbean islands, and the collaboration between indigenous and Afro-descendant maroon communities and resistance provide potential models for a future confederation of self-organized communities. This possibility jives with the vision endorsed by most supporters of Venezuela's communal movement, who believed that the socialist future in Venezuela should be based on a network of communal organizations that cooperatively produce to satisfy their own collective needs and share their surpluses with other organized communities through a widening web of non-market relations based on solidarity. Such a vision is not strictly anti-statist, but rather posits the Venezuelan state as initially coexisting in a dialectical relation with a plurality of self-organized communes, Later, as the transition process advances, the state will be transcended and surpassed by the forces of communal organization. It is surely a positive sign that the grassroots vision of social transformation coincides with Marx's overall conceptualization of communist society as consisting of communities of freely associated producers and is underpinned by the German theorist's mature theoretical analysis. End quote. So, yeah, again, like this is a very interesting, very compelling section of the book for me. In part, I think, you know, what I appreciate about it is its potential to bring together different strains and histories of, you know, communal forms. And, you know, obviously you're not looking just to go back to the past and reclaim, you know, some past, but, you know, you are interested in sort of updating and incorporating, obviously, technological advances and things like that. But it also has this important historical basis, this important basis in indigenous and maroon communities and histories. And it, you know, you make some arguments in the text for versions of kind of, you know, a romanticism and also to avoid a kind of strictly linear understanding of history and time. And I think too often there's a tendency on the Marxist left to look at radicalisms that base themselves in like, you know, indigenous or what in the United States we might call black anarchic histories, you know, Afro-Venezuelan in this case, and look at these as like backwards or difficult to incorporate into a movement to socialism. And I think that's because of the the focus on the state form as the kind of primary vector of that. A lot of this, I think, has to do also with kind of these ideas of progressivism and backwardsness that that we focus on. And like I said, using the state as an organ or mechanism to advance socialism. So if you could say a bit about these, I know you mentioned this earlier on, but if there's anything you want to say more about these anarchic traditions in Venezuela and how you see them as connected to and potentially advancing this communal path to communism. Yeah, there's a lot of points to, that you brought up. And to me, one interesting thing is how you link uh, the question of st- kind of a state fetishism or state focus to the progressive viewpoint, which is certainly the case. It's not something I personally have explored, but I think you're certainly on the mark there. But 
As far as the romanticism is concerned, I'd like to clarify something, and I think I explained my concept of romanticism in the book. It's perhaps an unusual theoretical framework, but it's not uh, unique. I actually, I draw, or I've been exploring the question of romanticism in earlier work. I wrote an essay called Walter Benjamin in Venezuela. And Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, the German theorist, Marxist theorist of the early, of the first part of the 20th century, he's what I call a revolutionary romantic. I use the term romantic in a specific sense. What would romanticism be? Romanticism would be a protest against modernity that relies on pre-capitalist social formations. Sometimes the protest can be reactionary. Sometimes it involves the worst kind of romanticization, the idea that we should go back to feudalism or something. So there's certainly reactionary elements in romanticism. There's also what I call naive romanticism. Maybe the best somewhat naive romantic would be Tolstoy, the idea of returning to the simple life of the village. By the way, Tolstoy's somewhat naive romanticism was a great source of inspiration for Gandhi, who I think also had, there were some problematic ideas in what Gandhi believed in. Um, to say nothing of his not taking the question of caste seriously enough. But oh, what I refer to is revolutionary romanticism, and that's the idea, which is, which is part of, yeah, I think it's the old, probably within the European, let's say the European worldview, the European Weltanschauung, it's the only way of finding our way out of the labyrinths of European thought, you know, like we're all raised in a certain European culture or, or in the case, my case, I'm raised within a certain European culture. And on the one hand, there's an endemic notion of progressiveness. And I always think progress would be a great idea if only we could realize it. But progressivism often is an implicit belief in linear progress. And that leads to stagism and it leads to a faith, at least into the actually currently bananas idea that capitalism is progress for the majority of people. Um, and so the only way out of that labyrinth, I think, or at least the, the way out that I choose is to think about this alternative European tradition that comes out of European thought, emerging on little more than 200 years ago, which is romanticism. And romanticism is the idea that pre-capitalist societies can teach us something. And as you pointed out in the revolutionary version, it's not that we propose to go back to some pre-capitalist social formation it's rather that we could go back to go forward. And it's also the recognition that capitalism, which is the standpoint from which romanticism developed, is in most ways not superior to many of the social and civil historic projects that preceded it, or continue to coexist with it, because it, many of them continue to coexist. So it's the kind of password or key that I think lets us out of that labyrinth of Eurocentric thought. I'd always like to point out that romanticism, even though I call it romanticism, it's extremely ordinary in Latin American thinking. It's maybe more common than the alternative. So, you know, the idea that the past has revolutionary potential, I mean, that's the most basic thing in Chavez's thought. Why was Chavez a Bolivarian? Why was, you know, why does he call himself a Bolivarian? Because he thinks Bolivar's unfinished project has revolutionary potential in the present. Why are the Sandinistas, why do they believe in, in Sandino? Because they think the same thing. Why are the Zapatistas... Why is Emiliano Zapata? Because they think the past has a revolutionary potential. It has leverage. And probably more critically in the current moment, the idea that indigenism, that we, we should learn from indigenous societies, which are not part of the past, but continue to exist, but in many places were eradicated or almost eradicated, that these were in many ways politically, socially, and in some ways even economically superior to our current society. So this idea actually appears in Marxism. I refer to to Mariachi, Jose, Jose Carlos Mariachi, who's kind of the, in some ways, the founding figure of Latin American Marxism, he recognized that, that the Incans had practical socialism. The Incans had practical communism. You know, it was, they didn't call it that, but it was a communist, in some ways, a communistically organized society. It, but that idea, even though Mariachi didn't know it at the time because Marxist studies were not so advanced, in other words, they didn't have access to the last writings of Marx. That's, that the whole way of thinking is very much present in Marx. So basically from the mid-1850s forward, Marx begins to examine his own ethnocentrism and begins to revise a certain Eurocentrism that exists in his work. And you can see that as early as the Grundrisse manuscript written in 1857, where he begins to question the idea of linear development and begins to look at, there's an extract that was put together by Eric Hausmann called Pre-Capitalist Social Formations in which Marx begins to look at communes as they were developed in Greek society, in Asian societies, and 
in German tribal societies. And he has a high valoration of those communal farms. And he asks the question is, how are people who are living within their conditions of production, how are those conditions of production, those conditions of life separated from them? That becomes a key question for him. But as Marx advanced in years, he begins to look at indigenous societies. He is fascinated by the Iroquois, the Iroquois Federation, as it's presented to him through the writing of Morgan. And he also, he spends his last years and his last months in, in Algeria, fascinated by Algerian farms of land tenure and recognizing them as their anti-colonial potential. And then maybe most, most centrally for the work that I'm doing, he has this engagement with the Russian peasant commune. And this is where his now famous letter to Vera Sassoula comes in, where he says the Russian peasant commune, Vera Sassoula asks him writing, I imagine Vera Sassoulik at that time, Russian, Vera Sassoulik was a former Narodnik who had attempted to assassinate a Tsarist official, a truly heroic person she was. And she later took some distance from the Narodnik, which is literally populist, but it's not populist, it's populist in the good sense. She took some distance from that movement and she began to work with George Plekhanov and formed a kind of proto-Marxist or one of the earliest scientific Marxist groups in exile in Switzerland. And so I imagine Vera Sassoulik was kind of between two worlds when she wrote Marx, asking him what he thought about the, the commune, the mirror, or the obscene, as it was called. And she may have thought that Marx would say, oh, the Russian peasant commune will have to give way, you know, kind of like a linear view of history, will have to give way to capitalism. And, and after capitalism comes socialism, after socialism comes communism. But actually, Marx kind of said the opposite. He wrote lots of drafts. And he finally said, no, I think the Russian peasant commune could be the fulcrum of social regeneration, could be kind of a gateway that opens up into socialism. So that's an important change. And I call that the romantic Marx, the revolutionary romantic Marx. And I think that's a Marxism that has a great deal of, it's the most actual Marxist, the most relevant Marxism that we have today. In addition to being a, a continuation of Marx's longstanding engagement with, you know, polit critique of political economy, his whole life project coalesced into that idea. When we come down to Venezuela, I've just presented the argument for a romantic Marxism, a Marxism that is respectful and learns from indigenism, that learns from Afro-Caribbean and Maroon communities, that can learn from different forms of non-capitalist societies and understand their superiority in many senses and how they contain germs or seeds of socialism to go forward. But I always think that Marxism can't stay with that, can't stay with that simple observation. It had, that observation, that recognition calls us to actually engage in concrete research in our given areas. It's not enough just to, to affirm it. We actually have to continue the project of trying to engage with these, what Mariotti called practical socialism, of trying to go forward with them and learn more and engage with actually existing indigenous movements and projects. And in that sense, in my book, of course, I think certain elements of the indigenous Afro-Venezuelan maroon legacy actually are widespread in the current society. They exist in a latent form, in an under-recognized form, in practices of social solidarity. There's a practice called Kayapa, which is collective labor practices, a little bit like the Minka, you call it like a barn-raising effort. The Minka being the Andean form of collective labor. I say barn-raising because that's what farmers did in, in the United States, they would come together in a collective project to, to take on a, a large work that was communally organized. And another interesting practice that happens in the barrios here is Sancocho. The Sancocho is a community meal. So a lot of these things are actually lit in society. You don't have to go out, outside of even the urban world to find them. But it's, at the same time, I think there's important ethnographic research that can be done. And the one I rely on in my book most directly is... Uh, the work of Mario Sanoja and Iraida Vargas, who are anthropologists in Venezuela. Mario Sanoja, maybe his most notable work is called Hombres de Yuca y Maíz, a people of maíz and yuca. And what he wants to emphasize is that, you know, it's, it's kind of a cliche to say that that's actually used in Latin America to say we're people of maíz. But there's another, there's a whole other kind of agricultural production, which is the production of tubers, not only potatoes, but also yuca. And that Yucca was a widely developed cultivation. It was the basis, along with hunting, selective hunting practices, it was the basis of a lot of indigenous communities that produced a certain kind of community or these communities 
highly horizontal, he calls them highly independent and autarkic communities. I think, and this is one of the important indigenous traditions in Venezuela, and you can see how it feeds into commune building today. Yeah, absolutely. And so you write about the currency experiment in the Che commune in the book. There's also discussion in the bank project in El Pernal later on. That there has been a lot of interest in alternative currencies and banking on the left in recent years in the U.S. as well. But I think these the experiments you lay out here yeah, show some of the potential and the challenges of these projects. So can you talk a bit about these experiments and some of their contradictions? Yeah, the currency experiment I talk about in the book is the one that took place, as you point out, in Che Guevara commune of necessity, they started their own currency. They called it cafeto. Cafeto is literally a coffee tree. And uh, partly there was, a, there was a real, I say it emerged out of necessity. There was a lack of currency. There was a terrific, high, even hyperinflation in Venezuela at that time. And so people, there was actually a lack of liquid cash. So it partly responded to that. But the most interesting thing about the project, and I think my reflections on that and the book are brief. My basic idea is the following, that these currency experiments. In the case of the cafeto, the, the money was actually backed up by a certain quantity of coffee that was in storage. So that means that the currency is no longer just a pure exchange value. It has some connection to an actually existing use value. And I think that is a step towards you know eliminating money fetishism of bringing the exchanges closer to a barter economy. But at the same time, so my reflection is the following, you know, that I think it's an interesting step and it could potentially lead to an emancipatory project. It could lead to a more, less alienated form of exchange. It could lead to a form of exchange more focused on use values. But that alone is not enough. It, oh, everything depends on how the process goes forward. Because barter, you know, barter happens all the time in crisis situations. It's quite common to engage in barter in wars and prisons. And that doesn't necessarily have a long standing emancipatory potential. So the question is how the process around it develops. It could be a way forward. It could mark a transitional stage to a non-market economy, but it, in itself, it's not enough. I think another interesting, um, I think you mentioned finances. Uh, all the communes have communal banks. And I, I think that that's one of the interesting, you know, people often tend to, it's actually David Harvey who brought this to my attention in that talk that he, he did. It's actually in one of his books. He talks about how many communal experiments they focus on our community or cooperative experiments. They focus, they kind of like isolate the cooperative and they forget about the context. And he actually drew a chart showing how capitalism involves also, it's not just production, but also distribution or commercialization. And it's also finance. And those are part of the capitalist totality. And at the same time, these cooperative projects have to think about that. Otherwise, they'll be eaten up by finances. Otherwise, they'll be eaten up by commercial networks that they don't control. You know, like right now, it seems like the appearance of capitalism is that certain commercial networks are acquiring a huge protagonism. I refer to Amazon and other platforms. They seem almost as important as finances in some ways. So if we think about, if we isolate the commune, if we think of it as a site of production, even democratic production, non-alienated production, but we forget about what happens before and afterwards, we're going to be in a very bad situation. So all the communes have their communal banks. And the thing that I think is interesting about that is that there's a high degree of realism. And the only way a commune can really go forward is to think about how it can generate some new form of financing, some autonomous form of financing, and develop some index of separation from the from the from the sea of capitalist finances around them. At the same time, I do offer in a footnote, I offer criticism of Harvey's perspective because I think it's important to highlight that. These are about kind of stopgap firewall measures or attempts to go forward in the capitalist economy. But I certainly don't think communal banks have a role in the communist society. My view of a communist society is one, and I think widely shared it here, is that a communist society would evolve overcoming commodities and therefore overcoming finances, you know, this kind of banking and financing as we know them, and also overcoming commercialization. But in the transition of socialism, it's extremely important that people think about these things. The most developed communal bank I know is the one in Alpal Canal Commune that I mentioned in Vence Cristinero. And they actually, it's interesting because they used the, the communal bank as a kind of planning, as the kind of center of their planning, their communal planning. So it becomes part of a planned economy or the degree of planning they can carry out has a lot to do with how the communal bank allocates resources for their different projects. 
Yeah, for sure. And so we also appreciate your discussion. Uh, Louisa Carceres, come you through this idea of the Soviet system falling between two stools. So can you talk a little bit about this idea and share a bit about Luisa Carceres' uh, commune with us? Yeah, I, the notion of two stools it comes from Esteban Masados, and it's a nice graphic description of what can happen if you kind of do a, a revolution halfway or you, uh, and that's a good way of describing what happened in the Soviet Union because, you know, there's obviously a lot of, it's a very negative image, mainstream image of the Soviet Union. Regarding labor practices, people like to point to, well, they basically assume that it was an authoritarian situation. But what they don't realize is that a lot of the authoritarian practices in the Soviet Union, as far as labor were concerned, was precisely because people had guaranteed work. You know, so the most authoritarian part of capitalism, capitalism says work or die. You know, you don't have to work for a given business, but you have to work or you'll die. And so that's the most authoritarian situation imaginable. The Soviet Union guaranteed life to people, you know, guaranteed work for people, and they couldn't, people couldn't be fired. So in some sense, in the Soviet Union, they gave up the most authoritarian part of capitalism. And that meant that the workers had a certain freedom, but they didn't have enough freedom to be truly autonomous, to have true motivation, to consider themselves full agents. So there's, there was this kind of hybrid situation where all the inefficient labor practices emerged, such as, you know, that it's Michael Lebowitz who brought these to my attention in a book of his practices called Storming. Storming was to meet a goal or to even go beyond the goal. In the last minute, they produced a lot of badly made things. And it was a way of, you know, by in a purely quantitative sense, carrying out the goal, an externally imposed goal and badly made things and hoarding because there was no reason to help out another productive unit because each productive unit was judged on its own productiveness. So that's where I say, you know, the Soviet system fell between two stools. On the one hand, it didn't have the efficiency of dictatorial capitalism, you know, capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, even more so is just a dictatorship. It says work or die. You'll work according to how the boss tells you that you're going to do it. And it didn't have that kind of control over workers, but it neither did it offer them real self-management, neither did it give them the autonomy that would motivate them to feel that the work is their own. I guess in the Soviet Union, it was common, you know, to say that social property was the property of everybody, but it was kind of like a joke for many people because they didn't really feel it was their own. They didn't really feel that the factory or the public institution was their own because they didn't have enough real grassroots control of those things. So when I talk about the Luisa Castro's commune, you know, I say the book is kind of like an adventure, you know, where you learn, where you're invited to participate in things. So there's a concrete illustration of these two options in Venezuela's Barcelona. There was the mayor, who at that time was Chavista, progressively minded person. He offered the city services to the communes in the area, but he kept half control for most of the communes. And that meant the city garbage truck drivers were still under the under his command, under the mayor's command, not the communes. And all of those communes didn't work. All of that garbage collection project didn't work. But in Luisa Castro's commune, where they took over the whole thing, they put their own driver and they took charge of the trucks themselves, that actually worked. So I took that to be a concrete illustration that you have to choose which stool you're going to sit on, you know, and they chose to sit on the stool of self-organization and that worked. So that's where I saw a concrete illustration of what Esteban Masados said about having to choose the stool you sit on and not, and the way a hybrid system, which he sees, you know, he sees the Soviet system as a, another form of the capital system. It's not capitalism, but it's another form of the capital system and it's not fully socialist. So we can see how it's important to go the whole way in terms of self-organization. Yeah, right on. And I'll just say, as far as that particular distinction of the capital system and we do talk about that more extensively in the last conversation we had for folks that are curious about that because it's yeah it's a it's a different orientation towards examining the soviet system for sure so despite the existence of the law supporting the communes in venezuela the communes are often in an antagonistic relationship with the state particularly though not exclusively via local authorities and police I and mean, also unsurprisingly the local bourgeoisie uh so can you talk about some of the examples of these contradictions that you've run into in your examinations of the communes in Venezuela? And, and can you also talk about how the communes have sought to deal with these contradictions, including within the communal art union? 
Oh, uh, you know, the communi- yeah, I have a whole chapter devoted to the Communist Art Union. The, the, it's a giant issue. And I say from the beginning of the book that the ongoing theme in the book is a relation between state power and popular power between the states and the state and the communes. So it's dealt with pretty explicitly in the chapter on the Communist Art Union, but it's kind of what we call a transversal axis, an AK transversal in the book that I think is one of the key issues. I should point out that they're complicated, to say the least, the complicated relation with the state is actually inevitable, right? Once you abandon the radically autonomous idea of Zapatistas, which is glorious, but I don't think it has as much power as the Chavista idea, which is not only the Chavista idea, but it's a widespread idea that popular power can emerge in a dialectical relationship with state power. Once you embrace that idea, you're going to face that kind of contradiction. You know, Meseros uh, said that capital, the capital system has three main components. It has the state, and it has capital, and it has wage labor. And he said you can't just abolish one right away, any one of them right away. You have to work in from the inside, eliminating all three of them. It, that's why he said it's like a process of remodeling a house from within. And it, it was that I'll kind of anticipate my conclusion. The key locus for change has to be reorganization of the labor process inside the communal system. So even though the object is to transform the whole capitalist society and, and transform the whole state to even abolish the whole all state power, the key locus for that change has to be the communes. And that's, I say that's kind of, I'm in, kind of anticipating my conclusion. But you're right that it's a highly contested relationship, but it's necessarily contested. So the communes, for example, I point out to the, the commune or union. What is the commune or union? It's an attempt to organize communes. And, you know, Travis himself said that isolated commune was counter revolutionary. The, the communes were like cells, and the cell needed a body. So that's important important statement because and correct because if a commune is just isolated then it will just turn into a romantic in the bad sense proposal and not go forward so to be part of a, a strategic project for overcoming capitalism it needs to form part of a system and the best way of constructing that system is if the communes form their unions federations and some people talk about even a communal state and that's what the commune community union tries to do but within the communes build a union that will go forward with the idea of forming a federation of communes that will ultimately abolish the state it's interesting that when the commune art union was formed about a year and a half ago immediately the state responded uh, it's interesting immediately they did a change of ministers they changed the communal minister and i actually tell that story in my book jorge Ariasa, who was the son-in-law of chavez became the communal minister He's a person who has a lot of cachet as someone who's part of the popular movement, or at least respected by the popular movement. So the state acted very quickly in the face of the forming of the Communist Art Union. And then Jorge Arriazar named a person from the popular movement as one of his vice ministers, Hernan Vargas, an interesting person who comes from a social movement in the urban context. So you can see the push and pull automatically emerging. It would be completely contradictory if I said the state was the enemy in this. No. The state is an ally, but it's also an ally you have to treat with certain with a great deal of care, and and, it's, and you have to draw some red lines. So that's the situation we find ourselves in now, with the Ministry of Communes showing a more positive face, and there's potential for exchange, for dialogue, for cooperation. That's the situation, as I said, that people, the commune arts, find themselves in now. I think that my word of caution is that I think it's extremely important. Mesteros talked about the communes as a kind of Archimedean point. You know, I said how Mesteros talks about there being three main pillars of capitalism, the state, capital, and wage labor. But the key focus of change has to be reorganizing labor to transform the whole economy and the state. And he talked about the communes as a kind of Archimedean point where that change would, that would be where the leverage of change happens. So my word of caution to people in the Communist Art Union is that I think that the, the focus has to be popular power the focus has to be building popular power, and it would be extremely dangerous or actually pyrrhic victory to turn one's back on the, on the actual processes of construction. In this chapter on the Communist Union, I offer some, I chart how the Communist Union is born under the idea of democratic centralism. And democratic centralism is a great idea that's all, it's very hard to realize. It always, almost always tends to be more centralist than democratic. And so the danger that the Communist Union is facing is that in its kind of push and pull with state power, there won't be enough emphasis on communal construction, which is the Archimedean point for social change. So that's my word. You know, it's not enough to tell a story. It's also important to draw conclusions.
and to develop hypotheses. And my claim, my contribution to the debate is that I think it's that it's important to maintain the the building and popular power and maintain the actual construction of the communes. And then the second level, work and try to establish, try to draw resources from the state. When I say drawing resources from the state, there's a whole element, you know, in a it's right now commonly understood that a lot of Marx's ideas about developing socialism, in spite of the the later turn towards a more romantic, less Eurocentric viewpoint, imagine the revolution taking place in Europe where productive forces would already be highly developed. And as it turns out, and it's pretty well, it's pretty clear right now that that's not where the revolution is going to take place. So that means that there has to be a process of accumulation of some kind to actually construct forms of life, a form of economy that will give people the liberties, the full human development they desire. And in the Soviet Union, in the early years of the Soviet Union, there was this whole debate about what was called primary socialist accumulation. And an interesting debate, and people often under-recognize the rich intellectual atmosphere of the first decade of the Soviet Union. But here, I think that debate exists right now because the question is, where are the resources to take these communes forward to make them sites, I call them real matrices of all around human development. Where are those resources going to come from? In the Soviet Union, Freo Brzezinski, a fascinating intellectual, thought they would necessarily come through a kind of expropriation of peasants. Nothing could be farther from the truth here. Rather, it has to come from the state, which manages the oil resource. That's where the primary social accumulation can happen here. And that's one of the major projects of organizations like the Communist Art Union or other efforts for the communists to organize is to pressure the state to open its hands and allow for a kind of primary communal accumulation. They can take communes forward with the technology and science that's necessary to make an emancipated. And I don't mean to make a, nothing to be further from my desire to make this fetish out of productivism, but it's necessary for a certain level of technification even to, to go hand in hand with the new social relations that are being built in the communes. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So in your chapter on communal practices among industrial workers, you talk about the radically changed environment of work at Indorka, a, a metallurgy shop, I believe. You talk in this section about how, quote, Che Guevara during his time in Cuba put great emphasis on voluntary labor as a means of generating a new attitude toward work and transforming the human subjects themselves, end quote. And, you know, this is just kind of, it, as I was reading through this, it brought up, you know, I don't remember whether I asked, you know, or whether we asked this question when we did the discussion on Venezuela, President as Struggle, the book you wrote with Sierra Pascual Marquina. But I remember that communards sometimes referred to themselves as Guevarists. And in a way that like, you know, you might have people refer to themselves as Marxist, Leninist, Guevarists, or, you know, something like that. And, I, you know, this was, it stood out to me because obviously folks in the United States are, you know, very familiar with Che as a figure, but you don't see that type of articulation or that type of, um, it's not a tendency like that has parties or organizations, at least that I'm aware of within the United States. And, you know, but I also thought about Che's discussion of like the new man and this discussion of work. And, you know, I wondered what you think might be some of the principles of something that we might call Guevarism. And, you know, if, if you say that sort of this relationship towards work and the new man is, is kind of part of it, I know that, and perhaps we could get into discussion of this a little bit by discussing in Dorca and the Solidarity Brigades, folks like the Productive Workers Army, which you examine in the book, or other you know, other thoughts you have on that question. Um, yeah, you're right that Che Guevara is a Che Guevara is a person who's honored in a way that often distorts his legacy. I mean, he's presented even in Cuba, he's often called the I mean Cubans are in the first place that people recover the true, true Che Guevara, but he's often called the guerrillero heroico, yeah, the heroic guerrillero. And that's certainly true. And nothing could be he was the amazing guerrillero who won the Battle of Santa Clara, which was a turning point in the Cuban Revolution. And someone who not only talked the talk, but walked the walk, you know, a uh, middle class person, a, a medical professional who decided to give his life to the cause of the poor. So he certainly was the guerrero heroico, but that's not all that he was. He was also someone who even developed economic and philosophical theory. 
everywhere he went, he carried a giant backpack. There were no tablets at that point. So he carried a giant backpack full of books. He apparently died with copies of the uh, Argentinian poem uh, Martin Fierro in his backpack, or at least in his camp. So he was a tremendous intellectual. But as far as the most relevant thing, when I talk about the Solidarity Brigades organized by Endorca, this is a whole conception of how you mentioned the the new, I would like to say the new person, you know, Shea conceived the importance of the new person. And that was a tremendous, I would say, move on his part to question the dominant Soviet ideology, which was productivism. They thought socialism would go forward, people would eat better, have fancy refrigerators, have plastics. Uh, it was the time in which plastics were emerging. That was under Khrushchev. And there was a whole kind of focus on just expanding production and abundance in that sense. And Che Guevara rejected that. He wanted to create a new kind of human. He thought people should need to create a new human being. And again, I think this goes back to, you know, one of the earliest, of the marks of Marxism, one of the earliest works is the thesis on Feuerbach, which is probably around 1848, probably associated with the German ideology. It's a short document. And in that document, one way of summarizing the third thesis is that he says, the educator has to be educated. If the educator has to be educated, that means there's no outside educator. And the only way to, for people to change is through some kind of practice. They have to change themselves through revolutionary activity. Even labor, self-determined labor activities what can change people. There's an interesting Gavaras here, Tol Toby Valderrama, who um, was a former, an educator in Pedevesa, the state oil company. And he tried to, sum he was somewhat cursory, but he summarized Gavarismo saying, uh, conscience of one's social duty and voluntary work. Those are the essence of Gavarismo. It's a bit of a cursory claim. You know, it's like voluntary work plus consciousness of one's social duty. That's how you become a revolutionary and that's how you advance the revolution. I guess like any slogan, it has limitations. But what it points to is the way it's only by engaging in a revolutionary or self-determined practice, a voluntary practice, that we can change ourselves. And that's certainly one thing that Che did. There's this, there are these famous photographs of him engaging in voluntary labor. He did the dirtiest work, the hardest work. And he cut cane, like many people in Cuba. He drove tractors. He worked under the sun. And that model, which still exists, or at least existed until recently in Cuba, is part of the idea of how social transformation is carried out. So that's realized. That's an, an interesting, somewhat different chapter of the book you refer to. It's about Endorca, which isn't a commune, but I say it's a communally organized workshop, which is interesting too, because it takes place in one of the few parts of Venezuela that's industrialized. It's mostly a kind of failed or partly failed, half failed project of industrialization. But there, they, this interesting practice of occupied factories or occupied workshops. And in the course of occupying the workshops, they start spontaneously to develop solidarity brigades that actually ended up going around the country. And they, you know, you say that, you mentioned that Gavarismo, well, I would say, I think it was, you were kind of implying this, that it's part of the, it's part of the atmosphere here. And that's certainly true. One doesn't, it doesn't only exist in books, it exists in people's social consciousness. So they spontaneously adopted this Gavarista attitude in which they were going to carry out voluntary work. And that would be a morale boost, a step towards building the revolution. They say we repair machinery, but we also repair consciousness. And it's interesting. I didn't accompany it, but um, Sita accompanied the brigade. My co-author in the earlier book accompanied the brigade, one of Endorka's brigades to El Maizal, the commune in Lada State, the biggest, perhaps the best known commune in the country. And of course, these things always have bumpy starts, but it ended up being a very impressive project in which machinery and consciousness were repaired. And an impressive thing to see how also different cultures, industrial workers, rural workers come together and learn from each other and, and a truly grassroots, I would say, heroic effort in socialist construction. That, you know, one idea that I associate with Che Guevara is the example, right? It's kind of a, it's a commonplace, but it, to say that one teaches by example. But that's essentially what Che Guevara did. And I think that that kind of example I hope that the book, I feel like the communal experiment in Venezuela is full of that kind of example. And I hope the book reflects that. You can see it's one thing to see, the, it's one thing to talk about theory, but it's another thing to see theory and words realized in concrete projects in which there's also a, there's a high degree of, I would say this, 
interesting thing that people only see in revolutions. There's a high degree of self-sacrifice, but also happiness that goes on the project together. You know, people make sacrifices, but there is a positive spirit, an optimistic spirit that goes with it. That's part of showing the example that I think is part of Kibarismo and is part of the revolution here. And I hope it's reflected in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And so in, in your discussion of uh, Epinal, I felt some resonances and some divergence from the idea of a police abolition in the U.S. context where you write, I'm quoting here, without the presence of policing forces and in the barrio from which neighbors formerly needed to defend themselves, this community has developed an efficient internal security system that is about the neighbors themselves taking charge of what occurs and responding in thoughtful ways to incidents and problems as they arise. This flagship urban community has scored victories in a number of areas such as production, self-managed security, and education. To efforts evident relief, the most oppressive features of the state apparatus are not either held at bay or made to serve the people. And there is some light at the end of the tunnel as far as the most basic economic issues are, are concerned. All the while, popular power is emerging from the doors that have been opened for it by a vanguard organization that shows commitment to the people and political clarity. The relaxed atmosphere in the zone speaks for this. The burial fairly sees with the expression of local empowerment, which also reveals itself in people's confident, calm, and cooperative attitudes, as well as in the harmonious coexistence that exists on the streets. End quote. So yeah, if you can, just talk about this with us, uh, about the FNL and their approach to it, internal security, how they secured this existence, and some of the promising and challenging aspects of this project. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. Uh, this is about El Palmeo Commune, the Celeste, the penultimate chapter in the book. And it's the most successful, largest, probably urban communal project in Venezuela. And the story of the commune it reaches back to, of course, before the commune existed. Vente Tres Enero is a revolutionary barrio. It actually was achieved by occupying, building these buildings that were residential buildings that were built for allies of the government and police and soldiers in the 1950s by the dictator Perez, Marcos Perez Jimenez. And he was brought down and those buildings were occupied and they were renamed Vente Tres Enero, which is the with time of the rebellion that brought down Marco Perez Jimenez. So the barrio was born in revolution with people occupying buildings that were built for bureaucrats and soldiers. But the story of the barrio, as people tell it there, is that there was a long, you know, People after occupying the buildings were, uh, they, it was just the beginning of the struggle. They also had to struggle to get city services, to get water, or to get electricity. But then in the 1980s, and especially in the 1990s, with the police involved, they began to introduce drugs in the barrios. The police promoted drug trafficking in the barrios and engaged it in themselves. So the narrative that exists in the barrios is that the first project of these self organized colectivos, they're called Inventores de Nero was to run the police and the drug traffickers out. And so their idea is that that was put in as an effort to um, quell the revolutionary spirit of the barrio. And it's about territorial control. Now, it's important to realize they did it with arms. All the collectivos here are armed. But they did it principally through persuasion. You know, the, the Alexis Vive Collective, which is the vanguard. I should say that, you know, when I, I say that I'm against substitutionist vanguardism, well, that doesn't mean a blanket rejection of vanguardism. There's a vanguard that often constructs the commune, but it's a vanguard that attempts to promote popular power, not substitute for popular power. And that's certainly the case in the El Canal commune. There's a colectivo called Alexis Vive that did this project initially of securing the territory, running the police out, and running drug trafficking out of the barrio. And they did it around the turn of the current century, you know, around 2000. Those are the key years for this project. But I should point out, even though they're an armed organization, I would say in the books, they had the firepower to back up their proposals. They did it principally through persuasion. They always say they're Gramscians. They're, they may be Gramscians with Uzis, but they are Gramscians. And they, um, they, for example, one thing they would do is cultural events. They would do Senate forums in these plazas where the, that were used by the drug trade. And they would offer alternative forms of work to, to micro-traffickers. And that's how they began to... to uh, establish their territorial control. But if, as anyone knows, police abolition has to go hand in hand with the construction of a form of community security, a community safety proposal. And that's precisely what they did. The Vente Tres de Nero, the El Canal Commune, has their idea of, of developing safety for the community is that the community itself responds to problems before, before they become violent. 
and has alternative proposals that are principally based on education and uh, and alternative uh, consciousness and the diversity and specificity of response to problems as they emerge. So I think it's a fascinating example of, of really existing police abolition. And I'm not the only person to have looked at it that way. I think that uh, Gio Meyer actually has a small chapter in his book on police abolition that looks at the Alcombian. So it is fascinating, and it's also fascinating that it works. So I, I believe there are lessons which some of them may, may be specific to this context, but others are probably more universally or generally applicable to projects of police abolition. One thing that I think should be obvious is that the police are going to be part of a capitalist state, or if they're not police in a capitalist state, there'll be something like police, whether it's paramilitary organizations or, or right-wing vigilante groups. So I would say the important thing about police abolition is it's best if it's part of a comprehensive project of social transformation. And that's certainly the case with the El Canal Commune in Caracas. Yeah, right on. And I totally agree. And I think it's, you know, it's great for people who are interested in, you know, thinking about police abolition, putting it into practice, I think to actually study, you know, examples like this. Also, I thought our conversation and Orasami Burton has a recent book on on Attica that again, like looking at these concrete examples, even if they're short lived or and especially in the case of El Panal, where there's some endurance to it, you know, you get a better sense of the contradictions. And we, of course, agree with you that, it, you know, it's it. I mean, I don't want to call people fools, but it, I think in some level, it's foolish to think that police abolition would be something that would be possible, you know, under a capitalist system. But I do think that as part of a larger project of transformation, you can see these these examples and, and think about them. And there's there's a lot that they have to offer to that to that idea and that politics. So appreciate that. So to continue on, this is, I think, our last formal question, and we'll probably just, you know, ask you a little wrap up question. But you write of the communards of El Panal, quote, they are correct to bring pleasure and de-alienation along with internal democracy to the forefront of their vision of socialism. This is the essence of Marx's scientific approach to socialism. And in other passages of the Grundrisse and Capital, he refers to wealth as including the universality of the individual's needs, capacities, and enjoyments, end quote. That part was a quote from Marx. While claiming that, and this is quoting Marx again, capitalism is already abolished once we assume that is enjoyment that is the driving principle and not enrichment itself, end quote. And I, that's the completion of the, the full quote from the book. I appreciated these remarks and feel free to elaborate on them. But I also kind of wanted to ask you a sort of a related question to this, which is this idea of human emancipation, you know, which I, is central, right, to to Marxism. There are all these discussions within Marx and Engels, and we see this within Che Guevara as well, as we've already kind of discussed, of, you know, higher and fuller expressions of humanity that are achievable with communism. And I understand that these communes are not yet communism, right? They're not they're not fully developed or articulated in their fullest expressions, but you've spent a lot of time studying them and talking to people. And, you know, I thought this discussion around the the enjoyment and, you know, the pleasure and the de-alienation within the commune, you know, kind of related to this idea. And there's other aspects within this text. So I just was curious what you saw in terms of implications for humanity within your visits to the communes and, and conversations with people in them. One sees marvelous things in the commons. I think it's worth returning to the specific case we were talking about. It's a case of a textile workshop in El, Palcan, Cam El Canal Commune. It's called Avisitas del Canal, Little Bees of the Commune. And I visited it, and it was interesting to uh, engage in conversations with the workers there. And this is a case of my learning, because I'm one of those people depicted in the book who perhaps approached the idea of exploitation in a kind of bare bones manner. You know, like exploitation is that you have a, you control your own work and that there's no surplus value extracted from you. But I was taught by the workers essentially something else. I mean, that in addition to that, it has to have been an enjoyable workplace. When I asked them what was socialist about this commune, I mean, where's the socialism? You know, they pointed to things like 
the happy atmosphere, their enjoyments that existed in the workplace. And I call that de-alienation, de-alienation in a real sense, that it's actually a pleasurable workplace. So that's part of my getting my education in public from. And that's why I say the book is an example of self-education in which one learns along the way. I think the the last subsection of the introduction is called Learning Along the Way, and that's certainly what the book is about. Then I point out Bob Marx himself, you know, look, when I say recovering original Marxism, you find these passages of Marx in which he says, you know, we will finally, you know, that when work becomes enjoyable, that's when we will have achieved our goal um, in so many words. So when you say, what can one see in the communes? Yes, and I hope the book is some way a concrete expression of that. I think that the most impressive thing you can see is steps towards an emancipated humanity. It's one thing to talk about abolishing the rule of value over people, which I do talk about. You know, I, I feel like the scenic going on of human emancipation is abolishing the rule of value in the broadest sense, because the law of value is value production, the domination of value production in our society, the hierarchies it establishes, the hidden workshops that feed into value production. As we go on abolishing that, we see new human potentials emerge, new human creativities. There's a Venezuelan poet, Akibis Nazoa, who says, he gives this little credo and he says, I believe in the creative powers of the people. And I think I've seen a lot of the creative powers of the people emerging. I, you know, I'm someone who, when, initially when I heard his ideas, Aaron Bastani, the accelerationist, the English accelerationist, talking about fully automated luxury communism. That's an interesting thought experiment, but it's essentially a chimera. And I think the more interesting thing would be say, well, it would be fully educated all around human development communism. You know, that's, that's what one should actually pursue. And that's what people really want. And I think you can see the first steps towards that here. Whether it's, you know, seeing people's creative potential in making things, it's impressive what the Indorka workers make. And they're not only, of course, they project a new society, but they also project new techniques of labor, new creations. It was impressive in Luisa Castro's commune to see how people took an interest in the actual artistic development of planters that they were putting around the city, precisely because they weren't under the, the law of, you know, the law of value is also a law about time. It says Marx and the poverty of philosophy says that, that capitalism converts people into time's carcass. We're just like machines to carry out labor that's timed. And once we're free from the yoke of time labor, then we can explore artistic capacities and unleash them. I think the good society, the communist society is in some ways prefigured also, it's prefigured in many ways. And the communists is also prefigured in things like a party, you know, a good party as an example, a carnivalesque party as an example of people living a pleasurable existence. The Zapatista idea, which is wonderful of the world in which many worlds fit, can be expressed in a good party where you have many ways of engaging with, I mean, a party, a fiesta. And you can see how like fiesta and work can come together in the best situations, whether it's a workers brigade, whether it's a kayapa, which is the collective labor practice, you can see how that emerges that work ceases to be onerous and can become a site of self-realization. So I think we can see the first steps of that in the Venezuelan project. And that's certainly exciting to see. And I hope I captured parts of it in my book. Absolutely did. I really enjoyed reading the book. I have enjoyed your other work as well. And yeah, this one's out on Monthly Review Press. We will make sure to link that for folks. Thank you so much for coming on and having a discussion with us again, Chris. Is there anything else you want to say in closing? Uh, no, I want to say thank you for inviting me. I One thing I hope is that people will, I don't want to get between the book and the, I don't want to be, be, get between people on the book and I even less do I want to get between people on the movement. Do I want the book to get between people on the movement? So I invite people to read the book and through the book, you know, look to the movement and see the exciting things that are happening here in Venezuela as they develop. I think it's a rich process, probably undervalued because of endemic Eurocentrism and just you know, lack of communication. So here's a chance, among others, among other interesting works that have been published, but this is a new contribution to a, it's a window on what's being developed here. But if, I think two things that I tried to offer, one is the, you know, the firsthand experience, the chance to accompany me and my own process of learning and repeat some of these learning processes that I went through. And I, the hypothesis, a uh, theoretical framework that I put together partly through social reproduction feminism, partly through the value theory developed by the new reading of Marx. And that's the hypothesis about how communes work. So that goes hand in hand with empirical observation, with learning on the ground. And I hope people will read it and 
offer their comments and criticisms too. Awesome. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane and Josh. Yeah, definitely. Appreciate you.